uh, welcome everybody. Um, the um, setting of this lecture uh, is pretty uh, long uh, time, so uh, uh, I was suggested to have a, a break at some point after 35, 40 minutes. Uh, at the same time, feel free to uh, interrupt any moment and, and ask uh, questions. Um, so I will be talking about uh, um, uh, artificial intelligence technique called uh, compressed sensing mainly. So work that I've been doing in my group at the Fritz Haber Institute uh, in Berlin. But I uh, will try to give a, a broader context and especially uh, be a bit tutorial in the way we get to the uh, more complicated uh, uh, stuff and the applications. So what I am typically after, and I put already in the title, is uh, uh, looking for uh, uh, maps uh, of materials properties. And by maps, I really mean uh, 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 maps in a sort of cartographic sense, so that we have uh, a, a low dimensional representation of uh, uh, the material space, such that materials that belong to the uh, same class, so have similar properties, land uh, in a similar region of, uh, of the map. So really like uh, nations uh, in, a, in a European or world uh, map. And uh, this uh, particular example, I will dig a little bit into this one as a, as a kind of uh, guinea pig, is the classification of uh, uh, the crystallization of material uh, that are octet binaries, so uh, binary compounds that have eight electron in the valence in the unit cell, uh, and they mainly crystallize as rock salt or zimbland, and in this map uh, uh, you have uh, uh, rock salt and zimbland well separated also by a dividing line. Uh, but the very important thing that I will uh, spend most of the time today is to identify what is on the axis. There is plenty of techniques to do dimensionality reduction, and I'm sure you will see something uh, in the course of this uh, workshop. Uh, but the specific one I'm uh, uh, busy with is, is uh, techniques that let us look it in, uh, into what is on the axis and possibly have some understanding on what is going on. These are other examples uh, that we have actually uh, done in, in my group, uh, classification metal versus insulators, or topological versus trivial insulators, or also something that is not really uh, a map in the sense that there is a clear cut, uh, but it could be a map uh, of the uh, uh, absorption energy of uh, some molecule on a surface, and also in this case everything is uh, uh, put in a very a nice way such that uh, the, the more you go in, uh, in a certain direction, the more the absorption energy increases. Um, so it is also a map. Then I would like to point out that uh, uh, building this uh, materials map uh, is clearly uh, a quantum many body problem in the sense that uh, in, a, in a more abstract way than the one typically uh, people are used to in, uh, in say theoretical chemistry or so. <coughs> And comes from this observation, typically uh, when we are able to write the Hamiltonian of the system, uh, we can calculate uh, uh, the value of, uh, of some observables, um, but uh, not always the Hamiltonian, meaning the position uh, of, the, of the nuclei uh, in, the, in the system and the number of electrons uh, is uh, uh, where we start from. In, in material science, we typically have prototype classes, uh, typically with a formula or some prototype uh, lattice uh, 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 structure, and we want to find mm, mm, which material crystallizes in which uh, uh, structure, or uh, which one has a certain property, or the which one is the uh, one with the highest melting point, <coughs> and so on. Um, so this is the reason uh, uh, why we try to basically uh, build on top of electronic structure calculations. Even though there are uh, artificial intelligence techniques to somewhat speed up the electronic structure calculation in itself, uh, the what I will be talking today is more on uh, uh, upper level in which we assume we have done this calculation and we want to find uh, some general rule in order to guide 
uh, the next calculation or even finding a, the best material and so on. Um, why this? Because especially from a, a practical point of view, so when you want to go to the actual uh, material, uh, preparing uh, and scanning large material space uh, is, a, is a quite uh, complex and costly uh, procedure. Um, another observation is that uh, uh, we know nowadays, if you look into the large databases, the public databases, of course, uh, we, we know a few hundred of thousands of uh, inorganic materials, just taking to inorganic materials. This already includes uh, the metal stable phases. Um, and even for all these, uh, uh, so we don't know all the properties systematically for all of them. Like if you want to know the elastic constant, uh, uh, phonon dispersion and so on, uh, you have scattered data. Uh, not, nobody has done systematically for all known materials. Uh, we need a reason to do that. For fun. Um, the other observation is that the number of possible materials is practically infinite in the sense that if you try to put atoms arranged uh, in some large unit cell, uh, it's combinatorially uh, uh, large number. I had a once an uh, interesting discussion whether uh, effectively it is infinite or practically infinite. This is an interesting discussion, but not for today. They say for all our purposes, it's infinite. We uh, we'd never be able to explore all of them. So it follows, uh, obviously, that then there is something out there that we have not yet discovered that has to be discovered if it is an uh, almost infinite number. Um, and uh, these uh, data analytics or artificial intelligence tools should be, in, in my opinion, or what we are trying to develop in my group, used to uh, accelerate this, uh, this uh, scan by uh, learning trends and, and, and finding if there are anomalies. Um, and again, I'm spending a little bit time in building the, the, the context. Uh, the idea of uh, building uh, maps to understand the trends and possibly missing uh, spots is, is very old. And I show two examples. One is uh, somewhat in material science, at least uh, chemistry. And this was uh, uh, the known uh, periodic table of Mendeleev. And uh, uh, of course, there were many competitors, and we remember now Mendeleev because uh, uh, the his periodic table looks uh, uh, incredibly like the modern one. And what uh, uh, Mendeleev uh, did uh, was to fancy the right descriptors. Basically, the stoichiometry of the reaction of the element uh, R with oxygen and hydrogen was one uh, uh, coordinate, and the other coordinate was a somewhat ad hoc arrangement in, in rows, but what was not ad hoc is the uh, ordering by atomic weight. Of course, in 1871, nobody knew about atomic number, uh, and so, but still, uh, people could arrange by atomic weight. And this table you see, you have uh, lithium, potassium, rubidium here, and so on. So it, uh, it, it catches most of we know today, and today we know why it is the case. Back then they didn't, but the very, very interesting thing is that, for example, uh, Mendeleev fancied that there were two white spots here. If you go from zinc to arsenic, there was something missing, and even uh, predicting the, uh, the, the, the atomic weight. Later on, people found that indeed gallium and germanium directly fit the spot. So this is just by looking at the data without any theory behind, except believing in the numbers that they have, and arranging them in the proper way. So this is the key concept, because otherwise uh, you, you don't see trend if you don't arrange them in the proper way. Um, the other example I like is to show that so basically, as old as physics, uh, more than physics is, people have been doing data science. And uh, imagine that you have data on the trajectories of planets in the solar system as seen by the Earth, or you can calculate them. This is more close to the modern idea that you do the BFT calculation, but you have a lot of numbers that you don't make sense out of them, in the sense that they are just single points scattered in some high dimensional representation. And then <coughs> somebody comes and fancy that if you plot uh, s uh, the square of the orbital period on one axis, uh, once you have fancy that there are uh, elliptic trajectories, uh, and the cube of the three major axes on the other one, you have all your 
few data points, by the way, because back then uh, I guess uh, it was known until Saturn, uh, maybe Uranus, but certainly not Neptune and Pluto at the time of uh, uh, Kepler. And, uh, and uh, the idea was that this uh, straight line that goes through the, uh, all the planets has some fundamental uh, law of nature, or at least it, it's a signature of some fundamental law, right? So you have the data uh, collected uh, during uh, many, many years, but uh, basically uh, uh, well uh, prepared by, by Tycho Brahe. And then uh, Johannes Kepler uh, uh, did the statistical learning the, the, the completely manually and found the, uh, the fitting model. Later on, uh, Isaac Newton explained uh, that there was one single law that was behind uh, everything else. But I find nice that uh, with only a few data points, uh, people were kind of confident that that was the right law because it, it's beautiful <laughs> to begin with, right? It's, it's nice. Now, let's see if we can do this same thing uh, um, automatically. So the, the, uh, one of my tasks uh, uh, in the last few years was to see if we can uh, uh, automatize Kepler and, and, and having the uh, computer assistance uh, uh, such that we, we produce models and then we look into them. Uh, so we start uh, from uh, a so-called training set. So this is the first talk that you have about uh, um, artificial intelligence machine learning methods. So I will also try to explain all the terms uh, that you for sure will find more and more during the, next, the rest of the week, in particular tomorrow and on Wednesday. So the training set is the data that we know and we start from and somewhat we trust. Um, the idea here is that uh, it doesn't fully matter uh, uh, which, which uh, uh, method we have used to collect the data, um, if it is experiment or uh, density functional theory or so on, as long as the data are somewhat consistent. So that uh, we, in, 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 in statistics terms, uh, th there is no uh, systematic uh, uh, error that we are not aware of. So there could be noise, somewhat, uh, uh, some, some kind of noise, but if there is a, a systematic deviation, then we cannot hope I think that uh, uh, automatically any, any, any mach machinery, ma machine learning thing can see that because there will be forever a bias in the data. Even if a subset of the data, even worse, has a, has a systematic deviation, this is super dangerous. So your the training set has to be as trustable as possible. Uh, the next uh, crucial step is to uh, kind of uh, assign to each uh, data point a descriptor. So we are typically after a property. I'm, I put supervised here because this is the specific flowchart for supervised learning. You also have unsupervised learning. I will not touch uh, almost at all today. Um, but uh, 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 so typically we have a specific properties that we, we want to model an energy or a, a band gap, uh, or uh, anything even uh, uh, more complex of, uh, of a material. And then we want to fancy a way to uh, uh, numerically characterize the material. So this is the descriptor. It's normally a string of numbers that is usable in a, in a mathematical sense to uh, find a mapping from this descriptor to the property itself. Now, uh, there is always a lot of discussion on which statistical learning method to use. I try to put the focus on the identification of the descriptor itself. There are uh, 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 many works also in this direction that try to use more and mo um, uh, mostly human uh, uh, intuition and, 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 and reasoning. I'm trying to uh, give the machine uh, the task also to identify the descriptor. As you will see, of course, I have to give some hints, otherwise uh, uh, most likely the thing is not doable. Why I do that? Uh, because I, uh, uh, so if I fancy the mapping between, so I find uh, statistically the mapping between the descriptor and the property, then uh, hopefully I have a model that uh, is uh, much faster to explore than uh, the original model I used to build a training set, otherwise it would be stupid. 
uh, and so I can explore the material space. And ideally, I close the circle, meaning that if I find something new, or even if I just explore it and, and, and find data points that were not used for the training, I, I hope that uh, uh, they are confirmed, uh, selective, just randomly sampling uh, uh, with, the, with the, uh, my reference method that could be density functional theory, or even experiment. Uh, there was a, a big, in the parentheses, yeah, I didn't stress, and I wanted to just have a few words on the big data uh, thing, because, uh, yeah, uh, big data you have heard uh, uh, a lot, and so I, I wanted to just say what the literature says about big data. So the attribute big comes, uh, of course, by the amount of data, so this is the first uh, meaning that the word suggests, but that's not enough. So. In literature, people uh, uh, use the so-called four Vs uh, to characterize big data. So they are characterized by volume, velocity, variety, and veracity issue, normally not big, but. Uh, so the, the sheer amount, the volume, is certainly one uh, important attribute. But you have also a velocity, so how fast the data are coming. And this, I would say, in material science is uh, hardly uh, a problem that we have uh, too much information. <laughs> Normally, actually, building this training set is expensive. Uh, certainly, they have this kind of uh, um, uh, characterization uh, at CERN when they do an experiment and they have uh, so much data that they cannot even store at, at first uh, in first place. So they have to pre-screen the data before they store them. And so you have to be smart because you may lose what you are actually looking for. But the, the, the real important thing is under this uh, uh, quiet word, variety, and this is related to the complexity of the data. So I was told um, by computer scientists that just having a, a table, a name, uh, 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 address, and some, some number about the person, even with 7 billion uh, uh, entries, that's not really big data. That's a flat table. It might be a bit slow to, to navigate, but that's not... Uh, an issue. The problem is, it comes when uh, the challenge comes when the data are structured as we have in material science. So, for a material, you have uh, an atomic arrangement. You may calculate the energies, but you have an electronic structure. Maybe at some point you are after the phonons. Maybe you are after uh, thermal transport properties. So, everything comes not from just one single configuration, but an ensemble configuration. You have to know the ensemble and so on and so forth. So, definitely, we are in this variety complexity. Uh, part to, 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 to have big data. So when you are learning a model, you may uh, need to move at different levels. So in a, in a database, you are jumping from one table to the other. And then again, the problem of the veracity. So the fact that the data, uh, they come from a certain trust, trusted uh, source so that you can use them uh, uh, collectively to, to build your model. I want to spend now a few words on the descriptor. Uh, again, when we started the project, then we were paired with some uh, uh, computer scientists and uh, mathematicians. At some point, they were a bit puzzled by the fact that uh, w basically we want to do in material science machine learning because they said we are lazy. We know everything. We know how to write the Hamiltonian. We know how to solve it to some extent. Why do we need machine learning? Normally, people use them to find uh, uh, yeah, laws or, or uh, building uh, uh, expressions. Uh, uh, from data that people do not have an idea what's behind. So they just want that the data themselves are giving the, the information. In principle, we know. If we write the uh, atomic uh, nuclear position and we know um, the atomic charge of each of them and the total number of elect electrons in the system, we can write the uh, quantum mechanical Hamiltonian and in principle we can solve it. So that means that our descriptor is basically obviously there, except that the model it's a bit too complicated to really solve it. So why we are doing this, using machine learning, artificial intelligence for, uh, for material sciences, because we want to find uh, at once uh, uh, a descriptor that is somewhat already uh, embedding a lot of the complexity, such that the model itself, so this uh, P of D, is simple enough, right? Um, and if you look at the geometry, I allowed a little bit of mockery. I put in Gothic uh, translational rotational permutation invariant because, for example, you can really 
give to uh, any, any machine learning and try to some neural network or so on uh, XYZ coordinates. Uh, and then just, uh, okay, maybe you give the same structure rotated, uh, and, and then some point the machine will learn that, yeah, okay, there is a rotational invariance. Wait for that. We know that this exists, so we may write uh, a descriptor that is immediately a rotational invariant, translational invariant, invariant by permutation of atom, the obvious ones, uh, other things. I want to put another line here that is not the most uh, uh, explored at the moment, I would say. That is, uh, uh, what about uh, coarse grain representation of the atomic structure? I will show only one slide here later, but what I'm after is what if we want to capture, rather than the actual atomic position, the topology. So somewhat uh, we uh, don't care too much uh, about little displacement of the atoms. We map into the same material everything that is somewhat uh, similar in, in the 3D arrangement. This is very vague, I know, because uh, I, I will show one possible way to do that, but uh, uh, I think it's, a, it's an open uh, challenge and, uh, and a very important one because if we want to scan materials from a compositional point of view, having also the super fastest uh, um, um, force field that is machine learned is every time you have to completely relax the structure to the bottom before you can say anything about the property of that, of that material, it might be still cumbersome. What if you can just give uh, the, the important information about the topology, number of neighbors, something, such that you already have an int on, on important properties that you're after for characterizing the material. Then uh, that we have the chemistry, of course, uh, so the everything that is related to the number of uh, um, protons or electrons in the neutral uh, isolated atom, so when you want to characterize uh, the chemical element. So these are, are the ingredients. So everything else in all the descriptor, I, I think uh, cannot be disproved that uh, everything you will see this week uh, will build from either geometry and chemistry or both, because the, there is nothing else in our m world. Now, let's see how we do uh, the, the learning. I start by putting uh, uh, the simplest kind of uh, learning that uh, for sure every, uh, everybody has seen uh, in their uh, statistical uh, course uh, undergraduate, that is uh, uh, least square regression. In least square regression, you, you want to calculate, uh, you want to fit a, a given uh, set of uh, um outputs, signals, so this is the, the, the prop what I call the property, expressed as a linear combination of some input uh, uh, D, so the descriptor in, in, in this uh, modern language, um, in, in such a way that the uh, linear combination of this descriptor uh, uh, minus the property squared is minimized. So this is the least square regression. Um, if you have as many uh, input variables, so the dimensionality of this descriptor is the same as the, the number of data points, you know that if the matrix here is, uh, is non-singular, you get all, always one solution, uh, typically pretty unstable. You change one data point, it will change your fit. Uh, so typically you want to have uh, more data point than uh, uh, the number of uh, input dimension. But this is not always very easy to do because you have to know which, which is the, the right input. So if you don't know the input, most of the time, most of the settings I have in, uh, in uh, that we show today will have actually more input candidates than data points. And this, from a linear algebra point of view, is a problem because typically you have an infinite number of solutions. What do you do in order to uh, kind of um, reduce the number of solutions or to find solutions that make sense? Make sense means, uh, uh, as a first request, that the solution is stable. So if you change a little bit the input and the output, you don't have huge change in the fit. That means that this coefficient C here, here, right? And the historically, the probably the first uh, 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 way people um, uh, uh, solve the problem to uh, um, have uh, solutions that are stable when you have more input than uh, than so less impu fewer inputs than than the number of data sorry fewer. Uh, uh, data points than the number of input 
is the, uh, the ridge regression. In this case, it's written in the linear form again, so you still solve the linear problem. But now you see that you, in the uh, minimization, you have also another term. You have to pay a price if the complexity of the feeding vector C is high. Complexity is, doesn't say anything. In this particular case, is uh, uh, the L2 norm, so this is the number two here, that is the Euclidean norm. Basically, you are paying a price the larger uh, the, the modulus of the uh, vector C is. That makes sense, right? So if you have large vectors in, in modulus, typically it means that to fit certain property you have positive and, and negative large numbers, and this causes instability when you change a little bit uh, the, the, the output values. If you have smaller uh, values there, uh, most likely you, you get a, a lower, uh, a, 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 a higher stability. And mathematically, you can see that if you add this uh, lambda c with the unit matrix, uh, I should have the solution somewhere, yes. Oops, oh, these two should have been separated, sorry. So you can write this solution in, uh, in a close way, and uh, you get this uh, uh, lambda multiplied by the unit matrix. This matrix now here adds uh, this uh, ridge, <laughs> this lambda identity to the D transpose D matrix that could be close to singular. So this uh, adding of a ridge mathematically basically increases the value of the eigenvalues of this matrix. Basically, it becomes invertible uh, a bit more safely. The larger lambda is. Of course, the lam larger lambda is means that these things ga gets uh, large, uh, and, and then you have to have a, a more accurate. So there is a little bit of uh, uh, mm, uh, a trade-off between uh, uh, having uh, an accurate model and, uh, and a stable model. That is uh, also, if you think about, uh, a good thing. Um, now, what I want to show here, because uh, what I will be dealing mostly about is the, uh, uh, this regularized linear uh, expression, is the way people introduce nonlinearity in the model. And one way is by invoking this uh, um, uh, Hilbert theorem on the space representation. And basically, this vector C that you find as a solution of this uh, problem here, can be always represented uh, as an expansion over uh, the, uh, the input, the data point uh, uh, coordinates themselves, right? Um, so with these new coefficients here to be learned. So basically from this expression, and if you do this change uh, or, or you represent explicitly the vector C in this new base, uh, you end up with this expression, so these two uh, uh, equivalent, a and this is the famous uh, ridge regression. Uh, sorry, Kerner uh, uh, regression, ridge regression. In this case, it's still linear if this k matrix here is nothing else than the scalar product between d i and d j. So uh, I'm pretty sure you will have this slide to to look uh, uh, after uh, my my talk. Uh, uh, it's not easy if you have not seen it before, but I wanted just to spend a little bit of time to ground a little bit all these magics of uh, kernel ridge regression versus linear regression and uh, regularized regression. They all belong to a very, very small set. I think all the math you need is in these two slides. <laughs> and all the rest is about thinking how to apply it. And also this one can be solved uh, uh, automatically. Uh, sorry, um, in a closed form. So the trick, where are the nonlinearities, is that uh, actually the same formulation uh, can be exploited even if uh, instead of having an expansion over the basis function themselves linearly in this way, you put a nonlinear uh, uh, function of the input uh, representation. So you can still write this thing, and the formula is exactly the same, except that the, the k, the kernel now, is the scalar product uh, of the nonlinear function of the i and nonlinear function of dj. Why this is famous? This is famous because you can solve this thing without ever calculating this phi function. You just need the scalar products. Actually, in some cases, you don't even know the phi function. <laughs> you just have to define the scalar product itself. 
and then you can solve it. So the, the, the huge uh, discovery uh, here uh, in, the, in the kernel method is that you do a nonlinear fitting by doing linear algebra because again you solve just the linear algebra problem. And these are famous kernels. So you have the linear, the obvious one. You start introducing nonlinearities by just uh, taking some uh, power of the uh, scalar. Um, uh, uh, this one you can still rewrite as a, as a scalar product itself, and then a very famous one is a, is a Gaussian uh, kernel that you will see at length, especially uh, because uh, well, uh, Gabor Chani on Wednesday will talk uh, a lot about uh, Gaussian kernels. What you have to see here is that um, uh, this kernel introduces uh, always a similarity measure. That means uh, points that in their representation, so the di and dj are similar, are mapped by this kernel into something that uh, is uh, close uh, uh, numerically in, the, in this kernel. So the property that you calculate needs to be very close. Um, and this is uh, the power and the limitation of the method in the sense that this regularization that tries to find uh, uh, um, a stable solution tends to smooth the, um, uh, the, the, the fitting function. Uh, and therefore, when uh, two points uh, uh, happens to be close by in the representation space, also the property that you calculate uh, has to be close. Most of the time, this is what you always want, but there are cases, I will not really touch them today, but that there could be some emergent uh, phenomena that are happening just in a narrow spot. <laughs> and if you impose smoothness and you have this representation that is not uh, uh, taking care of that, then you lose it. So there is always this uh, danger behind uh, uh, a machine learning uh, approach. So, but if the descriptor knows that there is some <laughs> exception, most likely we'll try to put the exception outside. Right? So, let's see. Um, this uh, cartoon here, okay, it's not really a cartoon, but it's, it's a, a slide that I put to remember uh, that when you do uh, the fitting, you have uh, 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 three different uh, cases. Uh, and typically you want to avoid uh, the, the, the two labeled as uh, underfitting and overfitting. This is again preparation before I go to the core of what uh, we are doing. Actually, I will do a stop before that. And uh, so um, in these plots, the, the, the dark circles, I hope you can see all uh, them, uh, are the training points. So you want to fit this point and the, the open circles are the data that you have not used for, uh, for fitting and you want to check the model. So as you see, these points are the same in the three uh, plots. Uh, you have some uh, a cloud of point here, and notably the uh, new points uh, kind of low outside the trend. So, um, and these numbers are the training error, some error, somewhat defined. Of course, the lower the better. Don't really important which kind of error. And in this case, you are doing, uh, well, you don't know anything, you do a linear fit, uh, and you have a certain, uh, tolerable uh, uh, error in, uh, in training, but and, and the, uh, well the error on the test point, this is only the four extra points, is somewhat large. And you can see visually that you are not fitting properly because uh, it's too simple. On the other side here, you have a model that uh, is very tight to the uh, uh, data you have, and this is also not good because uh, 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 the new points here are a surprise. <laughs> And, and the model is not able. So you see that the training error is, is very somewhat quite low, uh, but the model didn't understand that uh, something was going to happen afterwards. Uh, so this is called overfitting, when you fit too tight to the, to the training data. And uh, uh, the optimum that you want to achieve uh, is the fitting. I said this is a cartoon because, of course, you never have a situation in which you have data in one-dimensional plot <laughs> that you can, <laughs> by your eye, check if the model is correct or not. Uh, you always have a more, more complex situation. Then you have to understand from uh, uh, these errors, some scalar indexes, if you're doing well or not. And this is much more complicated. And as I announced to the 
<laughs> organizers. Uh, I'm showing as an example of overfitting the logo of the um, of the uh, talk, uh, so of the workshop itself. So I would say that this here is basically, I think it's a linear fit, uh, uh, linear spline between each next point is the extreme case of overfitting. <laughs> and uh, so uh, hopefully by the end of the week, when you have all learned about things, this magically will change into some uh, <laughs> well fit. Okay, I think I can stop here for the uh, first part, if you have questions already, and then I, uh, otherwise just uh, five minutes, I think, a break. Uh, see you later. The derivation. Yeah. So the, this kernel. Uh, uh, we are yes. Ah, uh, this double bar. Double. Uh, okay, so double bar uh, is always a notation for some kind of norm. Okay. So and and here is uh, uh, intendedly le left uh, completely open. 99% of the cases, people use a, a Euclidean norm, so they put it at two here, it's the so-called L2 norm, but there could be something else. And actually, this one becomes the L1 norm, to be honest, it's, uh, it's just the modulus. So it's left, uh, yeah, uh, good question. So uh, the, the, the this is still good, in especially in this kind of uh, just uh, introductory slide, because uh, it, uh, it points out that uh, uh, you can uh, have a very different kind of norms here. And then you take the exponential, okay, that imposes a certain regularization on this norm, but uh, uh, the, the, the norm you define at the very beginning is crucial to, to define the similarity of the, of the input representation. Yeah. To what? Ah, uh, very good question. <laughs> uh, yes, I think I don't have it written explicitly here, but um, so, well, it's somewhat written here because uh, you, you, you know how the, um, uh, the coefficient C are expressed uh, in terms of the input, but if, if you think at the, at the Gaussian kernel, the, uh, the function from the input to the output is a sum of these Gaussians uh, with the, the fitting coefficient alphas in front of them. So you have a linear expansion over Gaussians, nothing more, nothing less. Uh, less. And every time in, in, in the kernel representation, you just have a, 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 a linear expansion over the nonlinear, possibly nonlinear um, kernel um, function. And if that is, so it's, it's an analytical form for, for sure, uh, but typically is not transparent in the sense that uh, you just have uh, a sum over Gaussians over data points. And in this particular case, yeah, for example, change the data points, your analytical function changes. You might have uh, similar results with different set of data points, but you don't see it easily. You have to just probe it. With neural network, that will be the next, uh, talk, uh, I guess, <laughs> uh, it's even, so ideally you could write it uh, standardly, the, the, the analytical function uh, as a, a linear combination, nonlinear, linear, nonlinear, nonlinear, but you cannot understand anything out of it in, in a human sense. So you need other means to probe the, uh, the model. Uh, exactly what I will talk about in the next part is uh, how to get models that you can just read. It will be more simple, a bit a little bit less accurate. You always have a trade-off, uh, but you can look into their face and, and thinking as a physicist. Yeah. Yes. The, the difficult 
Well, the difficulty in training, no. <laughs> the, the difficulty in designing the overall thing uh, is the descriptor. So you need the right descriptor. To some extent, also the right kernel, but is normally much less sensitive. I heard a lot of talk discussing whether Gaussian or Laplacian was better. I think it's normally 1% better, 5% better. I don't know. I mean, for sure you can show corner cases and, and pinpoint. The descriptor is the DI, so the what you put here. Uh, so um, you will see on, uh, on, on Wednesday, for example, that if you represent your atomic uh, uh, positions uh, as, as Gaussian again, and then you expand over spherical harmonics, you get a very complicated descriptor, uh, but then uh, uh, it works very well. Because it why? Because it captures similarities between structures in the proper way. The same, I guess, the uh, symmetry function by your Beller would be the topic of the next <laughs> thing. I mean, mainly your Beller. Uh, also capture this the neural network, but they capture the, the similarity in the proper way. So the idea is that if, if you have representative data points, they capture enough of the overall, uh, uh, whatever is happening, the physics of the system, uh, such that you don't have surprises, right? So everything is somewhat close to something else. Mm. I yes, yes, absolutely. Because then uh, uh, the, the, the training set itself uh, has to be somewhat diverse. Because if you are just fitting every time all, all, always the same information, most of the uh, models or algorithms will not be too much troubled. They will still get give a, a good fit. Uh, but, but then you discover immediately when you move a little bit that everything is lost. So your data points have to uh, be diverse enough uh, and, 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 and creating the right data set in some cases is extremely difficult. We will see, I guess. <laughs> yes, let's, let's just have a second. I wanted to introduce all the uh, uh, the concept. Si sente? Si sente? Test. Lo sentite gli speaker o no? Test, test. Ok, cool.
<laughs> no, no, no. OK. So I was here. No, I was a bit further. Yes, OK. Uh, just quick, a, a couple of uh, applications of this kernel uh, regression, but more on the descriptor side um, that I'm pretty sure you will not see in other talks. This is one of the first uh, um, uh, application in the group of uh, uh, Rampi Ramprasad. And um, uh, what I liked of this one is the coarse grain representation. So actually, the, these two slides, this and the next is about representations that are not trying to capture the actual uh, 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 geometry uh, to then get energy forces uh, when you need them, uh, but to get uh, directly properties. Uh, and these materials were uh, um, linear polymers made of these uh, monomers. So these are uh, strange uh, polymers with, the, so uh, I would say, inorganic polymers with these building blocks. And, uh, and the finger, so the, the, the descriptor that in this case was called fingerprints, and I would not like to do a distinction between the two, even though you m must could say the fingerprint is something that normally is a bit more abstract than the just numerical representation of the coordinates and so on, but uh, I think it's, it's, it's making too, much, too many distinctions. This is still a numerical representation, and what uh, in, in this uh, group uh, fancied was uh, that if you just create a, a, a string, in which you have a uh, number of building blocks of each type, right? How many times in your uh, unit cell you see uh, any of these seven uh, uh, letters? Uh, how many times you see uh, a sequence of two equal letters and, and or three equal letters, the triplets and the pairs? So out of the all uh, three-dimensional metrics in which you count all the possible correlation, uh, you f f have a kind of a very crude diagonal of this, and this 20-dimensional object you see, is, a, is an array with numbers. And then this defines your uh, descriptor that is, uh, it defines also the similarity measure because then you plug this into uh, the Gaussian regression uh, kernel as, as I've shown in a few slides before. And, and, and you get a model for predicting atomization energy, lattice parameter, electron affinity, blah, 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 of these things. And uh, these plots, you will see, I guess, a lot of them. Normally they have uh, um, reference data here and predicted data here, so they are good when you are on the diagonal. And yeah, they are somewhat good. Um, the other one, very recent, we actually presented in a paper that is in press, in press, <laughs> uh, and it is an interesting story behind. Uh, so we organized uh, a, a competition, which we gave a very curated data set uh, and, and, and then uh, put it on uh, Kaggle, that is a, a platform for a machine learning uh, competition, some of you may know. Uh, and so being a competition, we had to be very, very uh, specific in the definition of the problem. So there was a very specific training set for which we give uh, the input and the, and, the, and the output to be fit. And then we had to communicate the, the, the test set, so uh, the data onto which people would be validated and then scored to win the competition. And the problem was, okay, I should have put more in the slide. Uh, oh no, here, yes. So basically we have after transparent conducting of sides, so these are materials uh, uh, that have, um, um, so these uh, um, somewhat similar to perovskites, uh, some of them are perovskites, so you have uh, uh, um, uh, two cations uh, and, 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 and oxygen as, as an ions, always with the stoichiometry three. Uh, and you have, uh, uh, in this case, uh, uh, aluminum, indium, and gallium as, as possible cations. Then they build uh, several different crystal structures. In this case, eight, uh, we s uh, six we selected for this competition. And so people had uh, 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 atomic arrangement in six different crystal structure. Uh, for the training data, they had uh, the properties to be uh, fit. Uh, that was the uh, formation energy and the band gap. And the, and the task was to fit at once, uh, so to fit uh, both properties and have a, a somewhat uh, a total score, because you need only one scalar. <laughs> that was the combination of the errors on the two uh, properties. Um, I presented here um, because uh, the winner came up with an uh, interesting descriptor that captures the topology rather than the actual coordinates. Uh, 
for the uh, records, the, the third classified actually uh, very, very close, if you look into the absolute numbers of the errors, uh, used uh, uh, exactly the descriptor of Gabor Chani, so SOF, uh, not exactly, a uh, little variation, but basically is a superposition of uh, uh, atomic uh, um, uh, distributions. Um, uh, with the, the variance of using a neutral neural network instead of a kernel regression, but that's not important. So uh, 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 a descriptor like this, and, and I bet uh, uh, the, the, the neural network, uh, uh, according to your bellers, uh, would have been also very close uh, to, to that result. Th these are good descriptors, they, they, they give good results. This one won by a little bit, but I, I liked the, the idea. So basically what uh, the, the, the this uh, um, guy it was to uh, represent uh, crystal structure as um, as uh, graphs, uh, basically uh, where the the, uh, the unit was not only the uh, chemical species but already the dressed chemical species, meaning inium with four neighbors is different by uh, inium inium with six neighbors and so on. So we had different species: inium four, inium six, five, and same for the other. And also oxygen can be two or three. So you have more chemical species, but the actual input, uh, similar to the case in the slide before, is looking at the sequences. So how many times you have a sequence like this, o oxygen 3, gallium 4, oxygen 2, and so on. Uh, so you build histograms of how many times you see a certain sequence. In, in, in the final model, the, the, the winner used the, the sequence of 3 and 4, so uh, 3 and 4 uh, list of neighbors. Uh, histogrammed, this gives you again, uh, if you think, uh, the histogram itself is an array and you can plug that into a kernel ridge regression and that worked very, very well. And I think the, the, the reason is that the, the, the descriptor captures what is more important in these materials that is the, the local topology rather than just the specifically which angles you have and so on. Okay, now let me come to my <laughs> real uh, uh, work. Uh, that is uh, uh, compressed sensing to uh, uh, find models that, as you will see, are linear models uh, using nonlinear basis functions. So, and this is the reason I also introduced the kernel method because it's a different way to get uh, uh, similar mathematics, uh, but completely different uh, uh, accessibility to the result. So. What it will be about, it's regularized regression. So definitely we have this prototype formula in which you have a trade-off between complexity and, uh, and um, uh, accuracy. And as you see, something new appear here is a zero. I will tell you in a second what is this zero instead of a two. Um, and it is a dimensionality reduction. So we try to go from a large, uh, large dimensional representation to a low dimensional representation with the specific that uh, we look can look into the, the, the descriptor. And in a way, this um, dimensionality reduction is also can be seen as a, as a basis set uh, selection. It can be used also in problems when you actually do basis set selection. I hope I have time to show one example. And uh, uh, what I put also in the title is symbolic regression. So that uh, is a specific type of regression in which we try to find uh, the form, uh, the functional form, rather than just the coefficients uh, of, uh, of expansion. Uh, historically, uh, symbolic regression has been done with um, uh, stochastic solders. Uh, we, we, what I introduce is, is a symbolic regression with a deterministic solver, so you get always the same result, uh, independent of how you set it. Uh, again, this is the uh, uh, um, kind of guinea pig application. We want to predict which material uh, with the uh, eight electron in a unicell uh, crystallizes rock salt or zimbland. And by the way, when I started, uh, uh, we were talking to many people that were uh, expert in, uh, in uh, um, machine learning. And uh, the fact, so we started really with this example, just to clarify our, mi our minds. And when people in, in machine learning saw 82 data points, they said, you really want to do machine learning, and <laughs> there is no way you can do machine learning with it to data points. Well, you can if you find the right descriptor <laughs> and, and the right methodology. So uh, this is an example on 
coming back to the fact that if you know the chemistry, you know everything. So if I plot uh, atomic number of the uh, one of the two, the anion and the cation on the axis, we have with the color code red for Zimbland and blue for rock salt, we, we have a map, right? But this is not a map in the sense that, that is predictive because uh, everything is mixed. Imagine you remove one of these stripes of red here. How can you know if this is blue or red just by looking at the neighbors? Uh, there is no way. Um, what we want is this kind of uh, maps. Uh, historically, people have been looking for this kind of maps manually, so this is the reason why we address this problem. Um, okay, let me skip this one. <laughs> so what we wanted to do is to go from uh, uh, atomic uh, information, in this case some uh, information on, uh, on the atom, so homo and humo uh, energy value, uh, uh, radius of the valence orbital. This is all uh, isolated atoms, so nothing related to the structure itself. We take the atom apart, we calculate everything with Cohn-Sham equations, and we think that this uh, already contains uh, the, the difference in energy between the rock salt and zinc blend structure. So not only the classification, but actually kind of smooth fit going from one to the other structure, such that if this difference is zero, you are on the boundary. Otherwise, you are on one in the two um, things. I skip, uh, uh, well, very quickly, uh, what are the uh, Cohn-Sham values here? So, uh, 14, uh, we focus on the on the valence uh, uh, Cohn-Sham levels. Why this got mixed up? Uh, S and P, and these are the, the, the orbitals, uh, and we took the, the radius where the orbital is maximum. Um, okay, and, and the method that we, we used was, was uh, uh, expanding the property over basis function, as I have been keeping saying. The basis function, this is where the symbolic regression comes, are nonlinear function of this input that we fancied. So a little uh, stop now. Uh, the input, which input do I put? Okay, this is where again the physicist comes back. You want to put something that makes sense. Uh, as I, I will show now, um, uh, okay, as I will uh, discuss uh, in the next slides, uh, if mm, you put um, unimportant input, uh, the method is, is robust enough to discard this uh, unimportant input. But of course, if you do not have the important input, it cannot be found, <laughs> just has to be clear. So there is still some part of human uh, uh, brain that has to be used before you set up uh, this, uh, this machinery. And in this expansion, we are specifically after a solution uh, such that the number of uh, coefficients in, in the, the expansion that is different from zero is as small as possible. Now, this looks like dimensionality reduction. I show here because I'm pretty sure it will not be shown later. Uh, uh, principal component analysis is one example of dimensionality reduction, and I want to show what is the, um, the pitfall here. So this is very useful. If you have data represented in any large number of dimension, uh, principal component analysis finds uh, the direction in which the data have the largest variance. So if you imagine a cigar in some uh, n dimension, it first finds the, the, the direction in which the cigar is most elongated, and maybe the second one, and the third one. The, the, this game is nice only if there are only few dimensions in which the distribution is elongated, otherwise uh, you, you don't gain anything. Why? In any case, this direction is really a linear problem, so what you are doing is from the original uh, uh, representation, x, y, z, uh, blah, blah, uh, it's just a rotation, so you realign the axis along the, the first direction. So this principal component, the first direction, is a linear combination of all the input. It could be that some of them are almost zero, but you cannot control this. So you typically get uh, a, a low-dimensional map. This was exactly the rock salt blend as done by this in the group of Tchaikovsky, the two groups of Tchaikovsky and Andreoni uh, in 2012. So this is a representation. You you see that. All the, um, ah, the blue is now, rock salt are here, and all the zinc blend are here, and there is something in between the Wurt site that is a, a variant of the zinc blend uh, uh, structure. So there is some kind of separation, uh, somewhat uh, nice. Uh, the point is that if you try to read on what, what is on the axis, you will see a linear combination of most likely everything that they put as input. Uh, Okay, 
So back to our problem, the, the composition. So we want that the, the number of uh, components is as small as possible, uh, but we want to control also what uh, enters the, uh, the, the basis function themselves. So we use symbolic regression, especially we use the algorithm of symbolic regression. That is, we define a, a vocabulary of operators, sums, uh, differences with absolute value, products, uh, or unary operator, exponential, powers, and then we iterate, right? We have done a sum and, uh, and a difference, and we apply a, a ratio. So uh, if you, this is the first time you see such representation, is not uh, immediately intuitive, but that means that you do the ratio of this and this. And it's nice, a true representation like this, because you can at any time substitute a node with a subtree, and you still have a formula that uh, is well constructed mathematically. If you have ever had an HP, uh, calculator, <laughs> and you have uh, at least the same my age, <laughs> you have been played with this a lot. This has been applied uh, uh, also in material science before uh, with this uh, stochastic solver. So this guy was looking for some uh, uh, silicon uh, uh, amorphous structures and, uh, and calculate the uh, some, some whole uh, depth. Uh, and and it, it finds formula more or less uh, simple to look at, except uh, that one has to use a lot of input. We try to, to build things that are a bit more uh, 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 inspectable in a way. OK, so mathematically, we write this complex problem uh, in this way. So we want to have a, a certain accuracy in the prediction. But we want also that the number of non-zero coefficient is as small as possible. And this is written in the same formalism of the regularization that I've shown before with just this zero here that is nothing else, nothing more than the number of non-zero coefficient of the C uh, vector here. Now, the, if you put a two here, you have you, as you have seen, you have a nice uh, close formula to solve the problem. Uh, C equal blah, blah, blah. This problem here does not have a such a simple for formula to solve it, even worse. Uh, the only way to solve it uh, is to enumerate all possible solution with one uh, uh, non-zero coefficient, two non-zero coefficient, non-zero coefficient, the only way to solve it exactly. This is falls in the class of the so-called NP-hard problem, and you have to go by enumeration. So that is nice to write, but not useful at all to solve. This is a reminder of the symbols, 0 and 2. Um, one way to solve it is uh, uh, the so-called lasso method. Uh, uh, originally, we also used that in, uh, in our first paper. And uh, uh, somebody noticed that uh, under certain condition on the matrix D, so this matrix of uh, uh, our candidate descriptors that we build uh, with uh, as no linear function of the input, um, uh, under some condition of this, this matrix, you can substitute the 0 with a 1. And that means the 1 now is the sum of the absolute values of the, of the uh, component of the vector C. And uh, magically, uh, uh, the problem is is the same, but this now becomes a convex problem, so you can solve it by just doing a, 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 a descent on the, on the convex envelope that is much, much better than, uh, uh, than doing the enumeration. Um, what are the conditions on D? So the condition on D is that the, uh, there are no correlations or no strong correlation between the, the, these, these vectors. Uh, and as many of these conditions that um, simplify NP-hard problem, checking that the condition is valid is NP-hard. Otherwise, there will be a free lunch, and there is never a free lunch, right? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if you think that your matrix uh, is, uh, belongs to this class, uh, you can try to apply and see what happens. Uh, but then uh, it, it may not work. The reason we went further, uh, so we also applied this method, but the reason we went further was mainly uh, um, memory. <laughs> uh, if you really want to have a huge number of candidates here, by huge I mean billions, and you have a few hundred of maybe 1,000 data points, then you have a problem to store your metric, matrix. And, and, and the method that you use to solve this methodology here is um, uh, needs to store the whole matrix. So you have to calculate always D transpose D. So not only this matrix, you have to, to, to store the, the, the square matrix. You do not have to st store the square matrix, but you have to store the D matrix, for sure. 
uh, even distributed, but uh, it's a complicated. So we, we fancy uh, a method that uh, gives a, a good solution, uh, so close to the optimal, uh, but doesn't need to store the whole matrix. But before I get to that, I want to show that also this uh, uh, formulation of the problem uh, was not new when, uh, when we started. So that is specif specifically this guy, Ozolins, that used this compressed sensing uh, for uh, um, problems in material science, and that they are all into the class of uh, basis set extraction. And the, the mathematician behind these are, are mainly these two, Russell Kalfish and, uh, and, uh, and, and Stanley Osher in particular at, uh, at IPAM in, in LA. So Stanley Osher is one of the main person in, uh, in compressed sensing. Um, and I show one example. So this was the a very famous example of uh, cluster expansion. In cluster expansion, you uh, write uh, the energy of uh, a given solid as an expansion over basis function that look like um, uh, pairs and, and, and triplets and so on. So in, on this axis, you have the distance from the central atom, and then you have, uh, as a second axis, uh, basically uh, the end bodicity of, the, of, the, of this expansion. Um, so basically, you see, this is a linear expansion, and you have a lot of basis functions. And you always construct such that you have many more basis functions than a number of data points. And then you want to sparsify, so find only the, the, the those that, that uh, uh, appear. And before uh, this guy Ozolins entered the, uh, the game, uh, people were doing it uh, in many ways, including uh, stochastic uh, methods, just subselect and genetic algorithm, basically, to, 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 to say a name. And it turned out that you can write uh, this problem here uh, with the formulation of compressed sensing that is uh, uh, you minimize some cost function, but then you penalize the, the sum of the moduli, so this, again, this L1 norm, um, in order to, uh, uh, to, to isolate fewer as possible basis function, uh, where the basis function are these ones. And this is the solution algorithm. I put it if you want to go through the slides later so that you have names to, to, to look for. Uh, I'm not going through these things. And also, these are other applications that I skip now. But they are all related to the fact that you expand some property on, a, on some kind of uh, uh, basis set. Uh, this, for example, is a, a harmonic expansion of a, a small uh, displacement of atoms. You should be familiar with that. And also, there you can sparsify so that you can uh, find only some components that are important. So our application. Back, uh, this is one slide to show why this L1 um, uh, kind of uh, uh, lens on a, on a sparse solution. Uh, so the, if you have uh, that your uh, solution is on uh, some uh, linear manifold, as every time it happens that you have more data points than the number of uh, input, you, you, uh, your solution is on uh, some linear manifold in n dimension. Of course, to draw it on a, on a, on a board, uh, it's just two dimensional. <laughs> Uh, and if you want to impose that the L2 norm is minimized, so the, the old ridge regression, 99% uh, 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 or more of the cases, you'll end up in the middle of these uh, sectors uh, because the, this, the, the, the circle touches our manifold uh, somewhere in the middle of, uh, of the field. While I the, the, the sphere in, uh, in L1, so the sum of the moduli, is always this edgy thing. It's a square, and then it becomes more and more edgy in I dimension. Uh, so it touches uh, the, the linear manifold always on the axis, right? So this is the uh, visual representation why the L1 norms. Okay, back to the problem, and then um, the the solution. Uh, one historical solution is the so-called uh, orthogonal matching pursuit, in which uh, one has to think. So you see again the problem properties and uh, linear expansion over the 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 basis functions. Um, and so there will be for sure, in, in, uh, so these are given, right? After you have calculated this nonlinear function, there is will be one that will have a maximum uh, projection on the property, right? So the property is a vector in, uh, in n dimension, same as the number of point, data points. And then there will be one of these uh, uh, basis function that will have a maximum projection on the, on the property. So imagine that you isolate this function, and this is easy to check, right? You do 
all possible scalar products, even if you have a billion, you have to do only, only one billion scalar products and you sort out the best. You don't have to have a full sorting, you just, just need the best. This is important. Uh, then you calculate the residual, what was not accounted for by the first one, and you calculate and you find this, the, the phases function that has maximum correlation with the residual, and then you can iterate. This is known as a orthogonal matching pursuit. It's a nice method. It, it's easy to show that it doesn't give the global optimum. What we did is to uh, uh, extend this. So we extract bundles of uh, nearly optimal solutions that correlate with the property and the residual, and we get uh, uh, subsets, so more than one, uh, typically tens to few hundreds, and then we are left with uh, a subset that was uh, screened by the, 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 the large set that we had at the beginning, and then we strictly look for the L0 regularized solution. That means we do the enumeration of all possible combinations, but only in a subset starting from the billion and billions. Uh, and the reason it works uh, is in this uh, cartoon, right? So you, 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 have you, you, you give freedom to the model to uh, uh, adapt to the property, but you, um, um, you still have a, a, a much smaller problem than just uh, finding all possible solution in all the space. And this is the uh, uh, solution for the roxol zing blend in which we have a descriptor that is uh, uh, depending on this radii ionization potential is a little bit still complex, but it gives a very nice uh, fit on the, on the property. And you can uh, look into what changes if you change one property or the other. I want to show only one other application in which I can show a little bit better that the descriptor, okay, I have to skip a few things. Um, that the descriptor uh, can be used to make new predictions, guided new predictions, not just sampling randomly. So this was an application in which we found a descriptor to classify metals versus non-metals in binary materials. Um, so we had this uh, perfect, almost perfect separation, honestly. Uh, these are uh, experimental data points. So they almost now comes because there are some uncertainty if some materials are really in the ground state or not. Uh, big, big uh, uh, but, but let's say um, we have this, and we have this descriptor here. So this, this um, part of the descriptor depends uh, explicitly on the atomic volume of the material. This one depends only on the stoichiometry. So, um, then it's in such a way that if you compress, reduce the volume, you go from uh, non-metal to metal. That is trivial for most of the materials. Uh, the point is that you can show where it goes from uh, non-metal to metal. And importantly, in the training, we didn't say anything about compression of the material. We just gave the ground state at uh, room temperature and normal pressure. Still, one could say, yes, OK. But uh, we tried with um, data points that were not in the training. And, we, and for these three materials, at least in the data set uh, from Springer materials we had, they become uh, metal uh, for not so much compression. And the, the basically, the prediction was always good. Uh, so it's, it's a combination of the fact that the, uh, the model is simple and captures the most of the physics, and the fact that you, we can look into the descriptor and say the leading term here uh, 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 not the leading term. If we fix the composition of the material, the only term is the volume that changes. And then uh, we ended up predicting another few materials that would become uh, metal easily, and, uh, and some of them not so easily. Uh, OK, I can basically stop here. Now I need to skip uh, <laughs> a huge number of slides. <laughs> but I, I knew I, I, I preferred more than uh, So I want to. Uh, put the acknowledgement of all the people that contributed to the things I've presented, but also do a little advertisement on a tutorial uh, that is a Jupyter notebook for doing step-by-step uh, 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 step going from, uh, from uh, a linear regression to this uh, CISO method. And uh, basically, you can just write me, and I give you the, uh, the address. Uh, and the uh, ID and password to do it uh, uh, anytime this week or, or whenever you want. Uh, it, we, we built it in order to go really step by step and, and see uh, what you introduce 
at, at each step, more complexity about what you gain by more complexity, and I thank you for your attention. Hello. So thank you for your talk. If you, have, uh, if you guys have any questions, uh, now is the right time. Is not. Ah, hello. Yes. I, I think I can even throw this too, but I think yeah, I can pass. <laughs> <laughs> I perhaps missed it, but um, how did how did uh, the team come up with the descriptor on the x-axis in which you said Just this looks? Again? The, the in the last graph where uh, you were showing metals to non-metals and how under pressure you could make them behave as metals. Yes, uh, ah, okay, yeah, you cannot really go back, but okay, yeah, yes. But <laughs> the descriptor had a term for atomic volume. Yes. But was that based on physical intuition or wa did it come out of some kind of... I uh, know, so the descriptor was uh, the... Ato the um, it contained the term of atomic yes. volume. Yes, so the atomic volume is just the... Um, Covalent radius that you find in tables, uh, cubic. Okay, there is a four three four over, oh, four over three pi, but that doesn't really matter. Um, and and then there was also the the cell volume. So that also comes from uh, the the value for the uh, for the material itself. So differently from the other application, here we need to access information also of the material uh, already built. So that particular material in the ground state. Uh, had this specific uh, uh, volume of the cell. Um, if you go to the paper, you see that, for example, we gave alternatives like uh, the interatomic distance okay. or some other candidates, and this was uh, overwhelmingly uh, the selected one. Uh, so this is exactly the, the, the main point of, of this methodology. You give candidates, uh, it comes from your intuition. So you think that this matters, this doesn't matter, this makes then you have this uh, general way to produce uh, uh, analytic or uh, elemental equations out of, of, of this uh, uh, initial set. Um, and then the, the those that really matter are selected uh, in the sense that uh, th this construction with this uh, specification is uh, extremely robust with uh, any kind of noise. Again, if you go to the paper, we really try to perturb uh, both the input values and the output values and uh, imagining that you are selecting two or three uh, components out of, uh, again, billions, you get always uh, s uh, scores. Uh, so uh, the probability to select the, 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 the main uh, descriptor, like 90% or 95%. So it is uh, extremely robust. And, and when we try to perturb manually, uh, so not physically, but just with some noise, uh, also, the selection was uh, quite robust. And this is not magic, it's just because you sparsify explicitly and you don't uh, follow just the, the, the single number that you have in your thing. And the typical question I just anticipate is uh, what happens to the second best, right? So you will have one that is always selected and another one that is selected the 10% of the cases and so on. So typically what happens if you think at, at the, the linear problem, that's why linear is good, uh, you, have, you, you have a different basis set for the same manifold, right? Or with some noise. That means that there must be a relationship between the, uh, the first selected descriptor and the second selected descriptor because they spend the same uh, or very, very close uh, manifold. Uh, in few cases, uh, we really could pinpoint that there was an obvious relationship between a certain uh, expression of, uh, you don't know, ionization potential minor electrode affinity and some other number that you know from basic chemistry, and you just find it again. <laughs> so that means things tend to make sense in this, uh, in this approach. Other questions? Okay, in the meanwhile, I actually have um, one obvious question is at a point, once you pre select some basis uh, doing uh, the orthogonal matching pursuit, why don't you, you apply L1? Is it a lot better to do enumeration? Of course, it's more limited in the number of, uh, of bases that you can treat uh, at that point. Uh, yes, no, good point. Uh, so when I do the, the pre selection, um, I basically explicitly extract uh, um, 
now basis functions that are highly correlated with themselves. Mm. So I basically construct the hardest possible problem for the L1 uh, regularization. Mm. Okay, makes sense, yes. Actually, that was not intuitively clear at the first, so we tried, and then it never worked, and I said, okay, of course, we are just uh, giving of the course. worst possible So it was basically <laughs> selecting scenario. all of them. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Uh, and maybe I've got another one as well. Uh, how do you select the parameter? Actually, I think maybe you don't have parameters if you do orthogonal matching pursuit and explicit ah, search. No, no, good point. L1, of course, has some hyperparameters. That, that was in some of the slides mm. I, I stopped. So there is a general approach, uh, um, especially when you have uh, a linear regression in, uh, in, in between, like uh, a kernel ridge regression. Mm. Uh, you always have some nonlinear parameters. Mm. And this is typically fixed by the so-called cross-validation. So that means if you have a training set, you fit your model. If it is uh, linear, convex, you have one solution, one model. And then you test it on some data that you have not used. Now, typically, since you don't have infinite amount of data, you just reuse the same data. You build a, a training uh, different from the one that you have used before. Some of them are the same. Train again the model. Now you get a different model, and you and you test on, on the what you have not used. There is one of these uh, collective models that will have the lowest error on the data that you have not used. Uh, typically, you select this one, and this fix your nonlinear uh, uh, parameters. You will, for sure, you will see a lot of application this week, but also if you go to, to my tutorial, you will see that. In my case, what are the parameters? <laughs> I can. Mm. Uh, it's the dimensionality. Mm. So I always show two-dimensional uh, maps in all the cases, the two-dimensional was good enough to capture most of the thing, but uh, for the octet binaries, for example, the third-dimensional was the, the, the one giving the, the, the lowest uh, prediction error. Um, that means three dimensions, so not four, not five. And then you see, because when you go to four or five dimension, uh, of course, your training gets lower because you have more coefficients to fit but your prediction error starts slowly to increase. It's not never really steep. Uh, so the parameter is the dimensionality, and then we have another parameter that I almost didn't touch, or actually I didn't touch. Well, yes, if you think at this uh, tree construction for the complexity of the formula, the tree has a depth. Mm. Also, that is a parameter. Where do you cut the tree construction? Because, of course, uh, each new layer in the, in the, in the, in the tree uh, typically uh, yeah, gets uh, uh, the square of the, uh, of, the, of the one before as number of, uh, of um, elements. Uh, so that is the parameter, and that also you can see that uh, when you go from level one to two to three, you gain a lot, and then uh, it levels out immediately. So the key word is cross-validation. You will find on the paper if you go there, but you will see a lot of cross-validation in all the In neural network, cross-validation is more tricky, <laughs> but you will see in the next talk. <laughs> Maybe, or in the rest of the week. Okay, thank you very much. It was uh, very interesting. We can go for coffee now. Thank you.